So we are appreciative of everyone's attendance today, whether you are a regular or a guest with us. Thank you for coming at the invitation of someone and allowing us to practice hospitality. We have a lot of people meeting uh, back in the fellowship hall this morning in order to make room, make it easy for you to find a seat in here. Appreciate them, and, uh, and we are just grateful for our time in worship and, and fellowship in here. You know, there, there are many wonderful things in, in this world, and by that I mean things that make you wonder. Do you ever wonder why the man who invests all your money is called a broker? <laughs> that, that makes me wonder. And you ever wonder, you know, if, if con is the opposite of pro, is, is Congress the opposite of progress? I thought I'd get at least one amen on that one. <laughs> you ever wonder if, if FedEx and UPS were to merge, would they call it fed up? Now I wonder why it is such a compliment to tell your wife that, that I have to be careful with this, <laughs> to, to tell your wife that she looks like a, a breath of spring, but not to tell her that she looks like the end of a hard winter. <laughs> Aren't they the same? And I, and I wonder why it pleases her to say that Time stands still when you look in her face, but not to say her face would stop a clock. Why is that? <laughs> and finally, I wonder why when the preacher says in conclusion, he doesn't. <laughs> There's a lot of things. A lot of things that make you wonder in this world, and I guess that makes life interesting, but in a more serious vein, I don't know of anything more wonderful, anything that will make you wonder more than the fact that the God of heaven, the creator of the universe, should want to call us friend. Did you know that God wants to be your friend? I'd like us to read a passage Revisiting what was read earlier, John chapter 15, we're going to read uh, starting now in verse 9 of that chapter and down through verse 15. John 15, 9 through 15, these are the words of the Lord. He said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know why, why, what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So among the things that the Lord talks about here, of course, is friendship. And he tells his followers that he wants to call them friends. Not just followers, not just disciples or servants, but friends. And that's an amazing thing, if you think about it. It's a wonderful thing. It ought to cause us to wonder that God wants to be my friend. It's even more amazing when you recall what the scripture says in, in Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5, Paul writes that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
While we were his enemies, he gave his life for us. Why did he do that? Another famous text of scripture says, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3, verse 16. I want to put before you this morning the idea that it is at the cross that we really learn what this means. Um, this friendship that God has proposed to us in Christ Jesus. The cross is certainly an amazing place. It is a place of wonder. It is a place of horrendous ugliness on the one hand, but incredible beauty on the other. It is a sad place, but at the same time, it's a place of joy. It's an incredible event. It is indeed the center point and watershed of human history. It's where heaven meets earth. It is, it's also a place where we have to make a decision. Um, and so among those things, let's consider what we learn about friendship from the cross of Christ. The first thing I'd like us to, to think about this morning is that the cross is the highest symbol of friendship. Jesus said in our text, verse 13, he said, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. And at the cross, Jesus did exactly that, but even more than that, he even laid down his life for his enemies, for the very people who were killing him, who were torturing him at the moment. His death was for all of them and all of us. But notice how the cross is a symbol of friendship. Just a few things here. You know, the cross is all about sacrifice. We've remembered that sacrifice this morning in the supper. Um, and true friendship really involves sacrifice. Go back to verse 13 of our passage. True friends are willing to sacrifice things for one another, even their lives if need be. Several years ago, Warren Sapp, who was a professional football player at the time, he was talking about how devoted he was to his coach, whose name was Tony Dungy. And he, Sapp said the following about Dungey. He said, I would take a bullet for him. But then he added, if it wouldn't kill me. And, you know, thinking about that, I'm sure that was tongue in cheek, but he wasn't exactly willing to go as far as Jesus, was he? Um, there, there were limits to what Warren would do for Tony, but there were no limits to what Jesus would do for Tony or for you. True friendship involves real sacrifice and Jesus shows that above any who ever did at his cross. At the cross also, we, we can see that true friendship involves intimacy. That's in verse 15, I believe, of our passage. Remember Jesus tells them, I no longer call you servants. He had every right to call them servants, and the word is actually stronger there. You could translate that slaves. He says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you now friends. Things change at the cross of Christ. Relationships change. Those who were once estranged from one another, those who were once separated at a distance, are brought close by the blood of the Savior. They are made friends by Jesus. And then also at the cross, we can see that true friendship involves initiative. That's in verse 16. Verse 16, Jesus reminds his followers, you didn't choose me, I chose you. 
He took the initiative, you see. He, he reached out to them. He called them. They didn't call him. Uh, Jesus, if you go back and look at it, literally went to the places these guys worked. Whether it was in a boat by the sea, because many were fishermen, or whether it was in a tax office where one of them worked, he went to the places they worked and called them to follow him. He took initiative. True friendship involves initiative. It, it involves going out of your way to reach out to one another. Jesus did that toward every one of us. And he did it while we were still sinners. And he did it when he went to the cross for us. Second, the cross is a supreme symbol of life. That may seem contradictory, but think about it for a moment with me. How could an instrument of death, the means of execution of that day and age, the cross, how could that be a symbol of life? On the surface, it doesn't seem to add up, but again, as we noticed in verse 16, Jesus says, I chose you. Jesus chose to offer us life as a result of his death. Years ago, the, the uh, news program 2020, I think it's still on TV incredibly, but um, this is from years ago. They had a story on there about baby chicks that were packaged and, and marketed at the time. And these tiny chicks were... Uh, traveling through a factory on a conveyor belt past all these workers that were uh, assembled there and, and the workers would select one um, and, and put it in the box to be shipped out and sold. And they were selecting them based on uh, sex and how, what size they were and general appearance, but there were several as that's being processed that were not chosen. And the cameras of the news program followed these certain ones who slipped by the workers, weren't chosen for whatever reason, and fell off the end of the conveyor belt. And pretty clear that uh, all those were just left to die. And that's sort of the way our world functions many times. If you think about it, if you don't fit into the box that the world makes, you're rejected and left to die. You know what the cross says to us? It says that that isn't the way that God deals with us. God doesn't choose us because we fit or don't fit into a box. He chooses us because he loves us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 that God chose us in Christ before the world was created. So before any of us existed, before any of us were even thought of, we were chosen. Before we were even made, he chose us. Only God could do that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, Scripture says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Because God chose us, because Jesus died for us, he gave us life through the cross. The cross is the supreme symbol of life. Only God could accomplish that. The last thing about it this morning, in conclusion, the cross is the clear example of what Jesus wants from us. Once again, in our passage here in John 15, verses 14 and 16, 
Jesus says that his followers will produce. They will do things. The first thing they will do is they will obey his commands. And that's, that's as important as anything. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. It's true. The Lord has taken the initiative. He has sacrificed himself at the cross for you, for me. It's true. God has chosen us in Christ before the creation of the world. But the fact is, he doesn't force us to be friendly with him. Friendship is a two-way street, as we all understand from daily life. God does not force us to be friendly with him. He says, if you love me, you will obey me. Now, those, those first steps of obedience, they're not hard to understand. Obviously, one has to believe that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was indeed the Son of God. Jesus says in, in Mark chapter 16 that he that believes and is baptized will be saved. So you have belief, you have baptism, you have faithful, obedient living, that's a, a quick way to summarize being a friend to Jesus. Now, water baptism is, is the point at which we become an intimate friend, a close follower, a true disciple of Jesus. It's the point at which his blood shed at the cross, which we remembered earlier in worship, it's the point at which God says that blood is applied and washes our sins away. Baptism is a, is a reenactment of the gospel. It's a reenactment of what Jesus took the initiative to do for us. Jesus died. He was buried. And three days later, he rose from the dead. When we obey Jesus, we die. We die to our old way of life. That's called repentance. We are buried in the waters of baptism where we are washed not by the water, but by the blood of Jesus. And then we're raised from that water to a new life in Jesus and to a sure hope of life eternal after death. So it gives us a hope that the world does not have, but desperately wants. What better example of friendship could there be than, than what we just described? Jesus sacrificed for us. We sacrificed for him. That's just what friendship is like. There's a story, true story, told by an actress of... Uh, previous era. Her name was Jeanette Clift George. It's about a, an incident on board a flight she was on. The flight was from Tucson to Phoenix and uh, she's on this flight and, and she noticed across the aisle from her a young mother had a little baby daughter with her. Both mother and daughter were wearing crisp white dresses. Mother was smiling, the baby kept saying the, th the same thing over and over again, dada, dada. And uh, baby had a little pink bow where someday she's going to have hair. And um, Anytime anyone walked by her, she greeted them by saying, dada, dada. Jeanette, the actress who tells the story, concluded, I, don't, I think I know who's going to be waiting when this plane lands, data. Meanwhile, everybody on the plane's paying attention to the, to the baby. She's sort of the magnet of everyone's attention. Mother had a baby bottle that was filled with orange juice. Turned out to be a rough flight and baby got fussy and the mother would pacify her with a bottle of juice. The flight became even more turbulent. Everybody had to buckle their seatbelts. 
flight attendants had to take their seats. And soon all of the fruit juice that had gone down the baby came back up until it seemed like there was more up than there was in her. And the rest of the passengers weren't in very good shape either. Planes just pitching back and forth and Jeanette, uh, the actress, kept reaching into her purse and handing tissues to the young mom to try to help her clean up the mess. Finally, the plane landed safely and, and, and instantly the baby was fine and you know what she said, dada, dada. Jeanette said she looked out the window and there he was. Had to be him. Young man, white slacks, white shirt, carrying white flowers wrapped in green paper. And Miss George thought, this ought to be interesting. He's going he's to come running and see that baby in that mess and keep right on running and saying, that's not mine. Well, Jeanette writes the following about it. She said, as he ran to the young mother, I wouldn't say that she threw the baby at him, but she did kind of leave quickly to go get cleaned up. The young man picked up that baby, and I watched him as he hugged her close to him and kissed her and stroked her, all the while saying, Dad is baby's home. Dad is baby's home. All the way to the baggage area, he never stopped kissing that baby. He never stopped welcoming the baby home. And I thought, she wrote, where did I ever get the idea that my father God is less loving than a young daddy in white slacks and white shirt with white flowers? wrapped in green paper. Friends, this morning, God is the ultimate loving Father. He chose us before the world was created. While we were still sinners, while we were a total mess, Christ died for us. And our Heavenly Father wants nothing more than to grab us up into his arms and love on us and carry us home if we'll just let him if we'll just cry out to him you see scripture says everyone who calls upon the name of the lord will be saved acts 2 verse 21 i remember a time jesus cried out to the father he was in the garden the night before he went to the cross Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Jesus said, Abba, Father. In their language, it was a way of saying Dad. Abba, Father. And you see, if we are willing to be adopted into God's family, God will send the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, verse 6. I hope you'll think about these things today. I hope you'll think about your relationship with God, your relationship with the man who died for you, Jesus, the Son of God. And if it's not what it needs to be, I hope you'll be thinking about what you need to do to make it so. This morning as we conclude, We'll sing a song that's just designed, if, if somebody has a need, spiritual or otherwise, to, to come before the congregation and state it, and, and, and we'll serve you the best we can. Perhaps today someone is ready to uh, meet the Lord in the waters of baptism or, or to recommit themselves to him. We offer you the time. We offer you the prayers of the church. Just let us know. And if it happens to be more convenient to talk to us afterwards, please please find one of us to do so. Thank you for being here. And if you need to respond publicly this morning, the time is yours while we stand and while we sing.